Hello and welcome to another Harrogate podcast with me, Andrew Gray. As you know, during the Harrogate podcast, it's my job to interview and to deconstruct the movers and shakers in Harrogate. Today, I'm delighted to have with me Nancy Prest of Doodle HR, based in Harrogate. Now, Nancy is many things, and I'll just list them, and I no doubt will have forgotten some of them. She's a business owner. She's a HR guru. She's the lead locally for the Federation of Small Businesses. She's a mum to Harvey, wife to Andy, and she's chair of the British Thyroid Foundation because Nancy is, as we'll hear, a cancer survivor, and I suppose sufferer, and much more than that. Nancy, uh, good afternoon, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, how are you? I am well, I've enjoyed our pre-chat, and uh, I've got plenty of questions here that I'm going to uh, annoy you with. But first, could you explain to my listeners um, what Doodle HR is, when you set it up, and why on earth is it called Doodle? Because it's a slightly bonkers name, if I may say so. Well, yes. I had I incorporated my business on Valentine's Day in 2013. Always good for an outing for a director's meeting. And I called it Doodle HR because I had a Labradoodle at the time that wouldn't look at me because I dared to have a little baby boy. So I wanted to make it up to the dog, who was called Honey. And so... The colloquial and friendly name for a Labradoodle is Doodle, hence Doodle HR. Oh, but of course, you should name what? it after a dog. And, yeah. and this dog, I think it was your office dog, was it not? Yes, we um, got it as an office dog when I used to work at Chorus in York on the railways. Unfortunately, we realised once I'd bought the dog that we couldn't have a dog in the office thanks to the um, owners, so uh, the dog became my own dog at home and then she's obviously been in the office at Doodle and she's frequently on social media. Very. How, how many followers does do the dog uh, have or do you have? Honey has more than me. Oh. I know, it's very depressing. Yes it is. <laughs> Now, before you set up Doodle, which specialises in HR, you worked, I think, for lots of pretty much large organisations. Just give us a flavour of who they are. I don't bore anybody oh. in and out of it. Just who are they? Who were they? I've done them all. Profit, not-for-profit, public, private. So North Yorkshire County Council, the Pensions Trust. They was not-for-profit. Fantastic. We had to spend money when everyone else was in a recession. Um, Chorus, which became Tata Steel, which gave me a really good grounding of dealing with trade unions and difficult, complex disciplinaries, grievances. Um, and I've also worked for law firms and uh, stockbrokers. Yeah, you pretty much ticked every <laughs> single box. Yeah. I can't think of them. You haven't done military, I don't think, but no. that would be a bit niche, I think. But more or less, you have covered the lot. Now, D- Doodle, I think, was it, 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 it about seven years old, but incorporated sort of five years ago, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us about your business today. How many people are you? How many associates do you have, etc.? Oh, well, we now have a business partner, Marie Davies, who used to be my boss at Chorus. Um, so we share the workload. And then we have up to eight other associates that we mainly use. And we have different people that have different niches. So we have someone that really, really likes really bad disciplinaries. We have someone that likes redundancy. We also have someone that loves employee engagement. So if you want to change your structure, we can get them in and they can talk to you about how best to change your business culture. So we have a lot of different varying contractors and associates working with us. Thank you. In that last answer, Nancy, you mentioned employee engagement. That just sounds like a bit of a faffy sort of HR speak, isn't it? You know, what is it? Oh, and how it can is. people benefit from in inverted commas employee engagement? It's the fluffy side of HR, but it is a really important thing. If you have an engaged employee, they tend to stay with you, you'll get more from them. So the overtime, you don't often get an engaged employee that comes and asks for more money. So everyone that has a disengaged employee is usually disruptive and that costs you not just money in getting rid of them, but the time to manage them, sometimes micromanage them. Whereas if you are engaged, you buy into the business just mentally and they become so much more of an asset to your business than just the wage. And I love that thought. It's fantastic. And I think it should be used across a lot more industries. So give us some examples of how 
business owners who listen to this podcast could make their employees or get their employees to be more engaged. And I'm listening as well as a business owner, you know, educate me, Nancy. It's not just about paying them a really high wage. You've got to get them to buy into your ethics. So if you say that you are family friendly, make sure that you find out how their family are. If I ask a friend, how are you feeling today? They love it and they know that you care. Whereas at work, how often do you ask someone, how's your family today? Or you ask, how's something working out for you? Or what can we do better? And getting an employee to buy into your business in, can I make a suggestion, is a great way to make them feel a part of the business and not just a nine to five person coming for a salary. Nancy, in your experience, what do sort of the worst businesses around here do when it comes to dealing with their employees? Is there anything in particular you think that is specific to Harrogate? You know, are we sufficiently forward thinking enough? Are we family friendly enough? I think it's a great place to live and work, but have you seen anything in your years of experience which you think is specific to this area? I've seen a change in the last few years. Um, Harrogate used to always be very strong with men and it had a very uh, businessmen were very key throughout the whole of Harrogate um, there's some very big names in Harrogate all older men and I think that put women off a little bit and I've noticed now that there's a lot more flexibility coming in so there's a lot more women coming in to different businesses in Harrogate and also there's a lot more flexibility for family friendly for finding out how to engage an employee and not tell them what to do and I think that's a massive difference and I think that's partly why Harrogate has Tour de France everything's coming to us because we are leading in changing our cultures and you are very Harrogate centric I think you were born here schooled here yeah born and bred (laughs) indeed you got it uh, coursing through your veins I mean, change your tax and what? I mean, do you have any sort of favourite restaurants or bars, clubs, dare I ask, that you go to? Clubs, no. Now I've got a seven-year-old. The biggest club I think I go to is probably golf club. Um, But my favourite restaurants in the whole wide world are William and Victoria's and Carriages. And I know they're my clients as well, but their food is fantastic. And I'm lucky that I've got a seven-year-old that's a very old boy. So he loves going to really nice restaurants as well. And he'll sit quietly and he enjoys good food. Does he wear a bow tie for these events? Oh, he has a little dinner jacket as well. <laughs> <laughs> now that is quite a Harrogate thing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, he is so Harrogate. I was going to say, even the dog's dog was very Harrogate. She used to go for grooming and salon days. And she also had um, a doggy daycare days. Who doesn't? Yeah, very Harrogate. Now, Nancy, you have this fabulous title because you do fabulous work Mm -hmm. for the British Thyroid Foundation because of a health scare that you've had and I think it's still ongoing would you care to tell our listeners about it if you want to and you don't have to tell us if you don't wish to yes and I love to tell people about it because I think cancer is a, a word that thanks to tv adverts people think is scary but actually it's only scary near the end and I love to talk and I think communication is key in everything and I think that if people understand that cancer isn't actually always that scary people will talk about it so to make my cancer less scary it's called Iris Iris the cancer Iris the cancer named after the Cacherelle perfume Harvey Nichols was launching the day I found out I had cancer I'm sure Harvey Nichols would be delighted to hear that well my son is Harvey Nicholas. Oh, of course. See, following a theme. Very Harrogate. Um, And I didn't want anything in me that wasn't friendly. So I gave it a name so it didn't become this monster. And all of my friends refer to it as Iris. And I have a stray secondary that's called Gary, spelt with two R's, named after my consultant's evil ex-boyfriend. There's great reasons, but how is Iris doing? Is Iris no longer with us and Gary is, or where are we? Yes, Iris is currently the closest I've ever got to Cambridge University, because my Iris is at Cambridge University, currently being assessed, to see if we can get any more information on thyroid cancer, which is used to be very rare, but is now in the top 10 cancers. Why do you think that is? Um, there is a theory that it's to do with Chernobyl. And because we have a lot of more radiation in our lives nowadays. 
but being an identical twin, you are a little bit concerned as to why you've got it and your twin hasn't. In fact, I'm not sure I knew you had a twin. It's, it's come up a little bit in the conversation, but there we are. You are yeah. Nancy, right? Yes, no, I am Nancy, that, definitely that Nancy. checking. <laughs> so uh, how much time does it take up your work as the chair? Um, not that much, mainly because I'm passionate about thyroid and thyroid issues, not just the cancer, but thyroidism a very small major organ in your body that regulates absolutely everything you do. So from getting up on a morning to having the energy during the day. So I'm quite passionate about it. So it might take up a day of my week, but I don't notice it. And I found out recently that men can have just as many problems. Well, uh, well sorry, that's not true. Men can have problems with their thyroid as well, but it's, I think it is more a uh, female uh, specific Yes. Uh, issue, I guess, is that correct? Yes, it is. It's. I think it's more the hormones, especially when women have the change or are pregnant. Any ch big changes in hormones can lead to thyroid problems as well. And at the British Thyroid Foundation, we have lots of leaflets and pamphlets that, that try to give people the information on different causes and what they can do to help themselves. Thank you for being so open with everybody. I'll now to networking, Harrogate is full oh. of networks and I ask everybody on the Harrogate podcast, so what do you think about networking? My question to you is this, you know, do you have any networking tips? Which networks do you go to? Which ones do you find more troubling if you dare to name them? Oh, I did spend one whole year of my life doing nothing else but networking. Or well, that's how it felt. <laughs> so I've done them all. I've tried B&I, I've tried the very rigid ones where you have to turn up on a certain day at a certain time or the ones where it's just pay as you go and um, the ones that's free and my best advice is find the one that fits your personality because I definitely don't fit into the turn up and on this day at this time every week because having so many hats on I want to be self-employed to go see my son in a Christmas show whereas if that's the same day as a networking meeting that you have to attend, you can't go. So find the one that fits you and your personality and your lifestyle. So, What about the pressures of bringing referrals and things like that? What do you think about that? That's why I prefer the more relaxed networking because I firmly believe, and this is just me, that to recommend someone you need to know that person because for me, I'd be recommending a doodle and that's my brand and I don't want someone who I've never really actually met and I don't know if they are actually going to fit a client's requirements unless I've spoken to them. So I think that finding out more about someone, having a coffee, having a good chat, finding out about them as a person and their company helps me do my networking and recommendations better than just saying I have to refer this person because they're in my group. Taking a similar approach then to to businesses and the hiring and firing of staff. Do you have any top tips for so when recruiting people or hiring people? Oh, my favorite word, communication. Communicate with them. So from the beginning, let somebody know that they're welcome to the business. Tell them that you what you expect of them. If you are about to um, phone me up and say they're not working out in probation, my first question is going to be, what have you told them is the expectations of you and the business. So explain to them, because if they don't know, they might think that they're working really well, when really they're not. So that's one key thing. Another is, if you have business values and ethics, don't just have them on a piece of paper and on your walls. Make sure that you live and breathe them. I go into businesses where they say, we're family friendly. Somebody requests a Friday afternoon off, and the first thing they'll say is, that's our busy day, they can't have that. How, who do they think they are? When really, you're telling everyone that you're family friendly, but you're not living by that. So always make sure that you think about your brand when you're bringing somebody in. Thank you. As we have quite a few business people that listen to this podcast and have been interviewed on this podcast, um, it might be worth explaining in very simple terms what a protected conversation is, because it's quite a useful Thing to know about as a business owner. I was an employee, but I don't think it's very well known as a protected conversation. Would you care to explain it, please? 
Yes, and I'd love to explain this because I love them. I think these are so underused in businesses. We get called up, there's a problem, and the first thing you have to ask them is, have you spoken to them? It's the same when you're recruiting someone. Have you told them? Have you spoken to them? So if it's got to a really bad situation with the re um, relationship, what you need to do is just say to them, can we have a protected conversation? And explain that what you're about to say doesn't go any further and it's an open and honest conversation. And from that, with a, quite a few clients, we found that quite a few members of staff actually want to leave to go do something totally different. And you can come to a mutual agreement and then all of the stresses from both sides suddenly disappear. I agree. I think they're very much underused and they add to the benefit of pretty much employer and employee as yeah. well. It's a nice, neat way of de dealing with things. agree with you there. Now, listeners, I was really impressed to learn that Nancy has lectured, believe it or not, at Lower Temple, which is sort of sets of barristers, more or less, in London. And she was instructed or asked to do so by a very famous employment law barrister by the name Daniel Barnett. For anyone in the HR or employment law world, Daniel Barnett is Mr. Employment Law, essentially. How on earth did you get that gig? Because that, you've got to be very good at what you do to get the Daniel Barnett thing. I mean, maybe you are that good, but oh, um, how, tell us all about it. Of course I'm that good. I know. Um, but we have a group that's the um, HR Inner Circle, and we do work and we follow Daniel Barnett, and he gives us advice. Um, and I came into that group at the very beginning, and as part of the group, I'm now a recommended person for him. And he asked if there was anybody in his inner circle who fancied doing a talk at the Temple Chambers. And I thought, well, it's something a bit different to do, so I volunteered. And then I decided to do a talk on dealing with difficult people, which is interesting to talk to barristers about. I bet. <laughs> more than being yes. difficult than not difficult. And really scary having Daniel Barnett on the stage next to you when all these barristers and employment law specialists look at him as the Mr. Employment Law Guru. So what did you say to them? Um, I, asked, I started off with an icebreaker and I asked them to turn to the person next to them, look at them in the eye and say, I really like you. Oh, that's a bit weird. Oh yes, but two minutes later, I was able to say to them how uncomfortable you felt disappeared once you'd said it and you'd started talking to the person you suddenly realized that the conversation wasn't difficult at all so it felt difficult and they thought it was going to be difficult to say it but it wasn't at the end because they became a con they became a conversation between them I then learned that two of the barristers had the same dog they've worked together for years and didn't know that so there you go. <laughs> Well done, you. I'm actually thinking that you're on some sort of calendar, is it, oh, for... Oh, explain. I, I am going to be Daniel Barnett's HR um, Consultant of the Month for May. Don't worry, there is no dodgy pin-up photos. It's just me explaining about my passion of HR, my passion for doodle, and how I think HR and employment law could be changed if I was Prime Minister. And if you were, are there any particular laws or terms that you would change? Oh, I'm sure not just you solicitors and barristers, I'm sure all of the clients listening would agree the word reasonable. What does reasonable mean in employment law? It's, it not, sometimes it seems reasonable for one client, is not for another client. So my favourite question from clients is, what's reasonable though, especially in disability discrimination? And we literally have to look at what is reasonable for them in that circumstance. It's a really hard word to put a value on. So I would like to do away with the word reasonable in employment law. And I think we should be very prescriptive. Yeah, I, I can say as a lawyer, I'm amazed how complicated it is for mm -hmm. us to get the answer to a particular legal question. And therefore, for anybody else looking into it, God, oh, blimey, good luck to them. I mean... I would love to live in a world where we didn't exist because it was much clearer, or you know, crystal clear. Maybe we'll never get total clarity with the law, but it, it ought to be clearer than it is now. Maybe it's our common law system that's developed it, but it's good to hear someone criticise um, and suggest new words and ways of doing things. 
Now, to Brexit, we're not mm. going to ask you whether whether you're a Remainer or Brexiteer. I simply don't care. But have you noticed any problems, opportunities for uh, businesses of Harrogate with Brexit looming? I will be totally honest. I hated Brexit to begin with because it felt like nobody was spending money and everybody was panicking and worrying what's going to happen. And then I realised that this is a perfect chance for companies to review their business and their structures. And then I started to get quite a few phone calls asking me to come in and look at restructuring their business. So we've been looking at what can we get employees to do more? How can we restructure how the employees sit in the business? And I found that Brexit actually is now focusing people's minds on their companies. So Brexit is a good thing. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. It is for Doodle. We love Brexit. Got it. Nancy, I know from meeting lots of small business owners that they find HR not only complicated, but they find it quite expensive sometimes to to engage with. And they think, you know, I'll print a contract off the internet. I'll Mm -hmm. I'll give it a go. I know how to hold a disciplinary, etc. Could you give us an idea as to pricing, how how you price? We've looked at this differently um, to what some of my competitors have. So when I first started Doodle, the first thing I did was sit down with some business owners and ask them what HR requirements they would have throughout a year. And then from that, we put together a package that we thought would help them. And then we asked them how much they would be willing to pay based on the lowest, the median and the highest costs of Yorkshire. And what we found was that lots of people really push a retained package, whereas small businesses don't want a retained, they just want to be able to ask a question or they want the contract, but they don't know what needs to be in the contract. So we've come up with lots of different little packages. So you can have a contract package, so you have everything if you're just taking on your first employee, to our very unique time bank. So you buy HR hours to use as and when you want, which can be for anything. And I have sat next to somebody for two hours and not said a word, which is very difficult for me. And he's just been on a telephone call to an employee and he just wanted me sat next to him just for that security. And he could use the hours for that. So it's it's very flexible as to what they wanted. And we send out a monthly newsletter to all of our clients, no matter what package or how you've used us before. And in that, we always have a special offer at the bottom. So we like to give back to our clients as well. So we do lots of things with other businesses in Harrogate. Good for you, yes, supporting them. And making sure they don't trip themselves up because an employment claim can be phenomenally costly if you lose it, but also costly if you win it have to defend the thing, the time that spent on it is, is monumental. So you might as well just not get yourself into that mess in the first place or mm-hmm. be preventative. Now, Nancy, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. It really has been. Um, we've had a really great connection during the podcast and also in our, in our pre-chat. How do uh, people find you? Twitter, I think. At uh, Twitter, I'm always on Twitter. It's so easy when you've got a seven-year-old to tweet. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn and Facebook. But you can email me on nancy at doodlehr.co.uk. We have our lovely website, which is www.doodlehr.co.uk. Or my mobile, because that's the best way to get hold of me some days, is 07960 223696. Or as you're walking past the Odeon, you'll see my lovely sign outside, number 19 East Parade. You can't miss a name like Doodle HR. No. Nancy, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.